Hey everybody, Tim Albrook here, and thank you for listening to the YFP Podcast, where each week we strive to inspire and encourage you on your path towards achieving financial freedom. This week, I had the opportunity to sit down with Kim Nula, founder of The Pharmacist Voice and host of The Pharmacist Voice Podcast. During the show, we discuss how and why she started her own business, The Pharmacist Voice, in 2017, how she had to pivot early on from her initial service and business idea, and what myths as a business owner she has found to be untrue. Now, before we jump into the show, I recognize that many listeners may not be aware of what the team at YFP Planning does in working one-on-one with more than 250 households in 40 plus states. YFP Planning offers fee-only high-touch financial planning that is customized to the pharmacy professional. If you're interested in learning more about how working one-on-one with a certified financial planner may help you achieve your financial goals, you can book a free discovery call at yfpplanning.com. Whether or not YFP Planning's financial planning services are a good fit for you, know that we appreciate your support of this podcast and our mission to help pharmacists achieve financial freedom. Okay, let's jump into my interview with Kim Newlove. Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. Good to be here. Well, so excited to have you. It's been a long, long time in the making. Uh, we, we talked back in the winter and then we had a chance to connect in person at the Ohio Pharmacist Association meeting. I came on your podcast and uh, re- really excited for the opportunity to talk several different things with you. Uh, entrepreneurship, we'll talk a little bit about a family, we'll talk about personal finance. And I want to start with your career and, and some of your career background. So where did you go to pharmacy school? When did you graduate? And what ultimately drew you into the profession? Okay. If I leave anything out, remind me. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the University of Toledo College of Pharmacy. I graduated in 2001 with my Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy degree. Never got my PharmD. What was the next question, Tim? So where you went to school, you answered that. Go Rockets, right? Toledo, uh, 2001. Right, go when you graduated, you, you answered that. What, what drew you into the profession? What drew me into the profession most was my Uncle Tom inviting me to shadow him when I was an eighth grade junior high student at Eastwood Junior High School in Pemberville, Ohio. He invited me to watch him as a surgery pharmacist at St. V's which is one Mm -hmm. of the major hospitals in the Toledo area. I also, of course, love to help people, and I was good at math and science, and I really felt like I had all of those attributes that a pharmacist needed, being trustworthy and being interested in helping people and being intelligent and all the things. So some of our listeners, uh, they wouldn't be aware, but may be interested in knowing. We share a North, Northwest Ohio connection. So my wife, Jess, is from the uh, Bowling Green, Perrysburg area. You're obviously in Northwest Ohio as well. A little Rockets-Falcons uh, rivalry that, that's going on between Bowling Green and Toledo. So <laughs> so you you came in, you snuck in right before the Farm D requirement, right? Because that would have been early, early 2000s. So you you came in right before that. Right. I was... One of the last classes to graduate was my class. I graduated in 01, and I think in 04, that was the cutoff. My brother, who's also a pharmacist, graduated in 03 with his bachelor's, never got his PharmD either. And yeah, it's a a great school. But yeah, our cutoff didn't end until 04 for some reason. And we're going to talk in a bit about the pharmacist voice. And for those that are, are watching uh, this interview, uh, they can see your background behind you. We're going to talk about the business that you've created, what you're doing, why you started it, what you offer. But before we get into that, give us some of the career journey, because I think this is a really interesting part of your story and your family story, as we're going to talk some personal finance here in a little bit. 2001, you graduate. Uh, it wouldn't be till 2017, correct, that you launched the business? Correct. So give us the the cliff note synopsis version of your pharmacy career from graduation prior to starting the business. Oh boy. Oh boy. There's some retail in there, some hospitals, some compounding, and some behavioral health. I started off working at a small hospital. The schedule wasn't right for me as a newlywed. I got married about six weeks after graduation in June of 2001, passed the boards right away, uh, like two days before I got married, which was kind of cool. Yay me. Everybody was saying, Mm -hmm. congratulations on getting married. Did you pass the boards? Yeah. Okay. Congratulations on that too. Then after that, uh, about a year of trialing out working at a small hospital and the hours not working out, 
I switched to working for Walgreens and I worked part time at that hospital for about five months to transition my replacement in. And then I was working full time at Walgreens for not, well, sorry, not for nine years. I worked at Walgreens for nine years, only worked full time for about one year. Mm -hmm. And then I had my first child. While I was working part time at Walgreens, I worked at a small compounding pharmacy and it, nobody would know the name. We got bought out by a competitor. But the focus was respiratory solutions for inhalation. And I coincidentally had baby number two right as we were getting bought out, never went back to that job. I didn't stop working for Walgreens until 2011. When I stopped working at Walgreens in 2011, our agreement, my husband and my agreement, was that I would stay home for one year and then I would start looking for another job. I started looking for another job immediately because <laughs> I can't follow my own uh, plan sometimes, but I didn't get the jobs that I tried out for. So I truly stayed home for that one year. And it was after that one year that my husband started getting other opportunities mm -hmm. and climbing the ladder, and I ended up staying at home. Well, fast forward to the year 2015, I couldn't just stay at home, Tim. I had to do something. So I started volunteering quite a bit. I had already volunteered some with the University of Toledo. And while I was volunteering, I got connected with a woman who invited me to be her relief pharmacist in, I think it was October or November of 2015. I had been off the market for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt a little rusty, but the job she offered me was really in line with some of my volunteer work. And it was at a behavioral health hospital. I worked there for one year. She moved on. I was her relief pharmacist. I didn't feel comfortable staying without her. So I ended that job and I didn't work again until I started my company. And so we're going to come back to that in a little bit. My first question for you, though, is student loan debt in 2001, very different uh, picture than what it is here in 2022, unfortunately, even, even if we adjust for inflation, right, which is something that we're all thinking about in the moment. Yeah. The numbers are, are drastically different. Our listeners know today graduates coming out on average about $175,000 of, of debt. Often that will be much higher than that if we factor in undergrad debt and other expenses for those that go to private school. So tell us about for, for you, uh, e even though that debt may have been a significant part of the journey, n numbers were much smaller, right? Numbers were much smaller. Yes. Uh, you know, Tim, every time you say that number, when I listen to your podcast, it moves up. <laughs> it <laughs> it does. used to be like 170. Now we're up to 175. And for students listening to this, much respect. I know that's a huge burden to take on. My student loan debt, I added this up before our interview here. From what my records show, I had $23,888.28 <laughs> in student loan debt. I used $13,650 for actually paying tuition and all that. And then the disbursements were a little over $10,000. And I lived off that. I bought my books, my gas for my car at what was it, 97 cents a gallon back then. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, I had to live off of that. And I actually went back to my earnings history too to find out how much I made as an intern. You know, in 1999, I made $10,000 as an intern, which was pretty good. But, you know, you got to live. And yeah, the student loan debt is, is, is real. And I paid it off, I want to say, in less than two years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think for many graduates today, you know, it, the number in and of itself is a lot to work through in terms of monthly payment. And obviously, right now, we've got a pause on those payments, which has certainly helped a lot of people. But it, it's not only the dollar amount, it's the, the paralyzing nature of the feeling that can come from that, that can cloud the ability to make other, other decisions. And so one of the things we, we often talk with individuals about is, you know, yes, we've got to attack the number or perhaps pursue something like loan forgiveness, but we also need to make sure we don't underestimate the power of having a plan. Even if that number doesn't change a whole lot next week, something is, is, is drastically different if we can start to put a plan in place so we can begin to move forward and consider that piece of the puzzle as we also look at other parts of the financial plan. I do want to come back to one thing that you mentioned, because I, I think that we often assume that pharmacists are the breadwinner in the family. Pharmacists are, you know, the ones that are going to be making a significant income, uh, especially if it's, you know, two incomes that are in the household. And you mentioned something that I thought was really important to touch on 
that others, you know, may be considering, which is you, you have, you mentioned your husband and his income opportunities before we hit record, you mentioned several points of his career where he had an opportunity to kind of level up to the next level. And I think that was an interesting approach that you guys decided on as a family together, that there was going to be an investment in his career and some of the upward mobility and upward nature of that income, which may not have necessarily been there with a pharmacist income. Can you talk more about how you got to that decision and, and why that was best for your family? Yes. And if I leave anything out and you need clarifying details, please let me know. <laughs> My story is very different. I mean, I come from a place of currently being a stay-at-home parent. And Tim, you talk about pharmacists often being the breadwinner because they earn more money than their partner. I am a pharmacist by training. My husband is a mechanical engineer by training. Mm -hmm. And when we started having kids, which happened pretty darn quick after I graduated, within like 18 months of graduation, I started having the kids. We talked about who's going to stay at home or what are we going to do about daycare? Mm -hmm. And at the time, we lived in Toledo, Ohio, which some people may think of as, you know, ooh, it's big urban area. How can you trust people? There were plenty of great choices mm -hmm. in Toledo. Did we have anything set up? No. I worked full-time, seven on, seven off as a midnight pharmacist. I made a great income. And as I mentioned before, when we started out, I also had a part-time job in the first five months of my, you know, employment as a pharmacist, as a, you know, part-time hospital pharmacist. You know, I had this income, my top earnings ever was like $97,000. And I looked at my husband after we had this baby and I said, I can make at least $97,000 working full-time as a pharmacist. Let's look at how much you make. And just disclosing how much he made in the year 2003 when our first son was born, mm -hmm. it was around $60,000. He made significantly less than me. And he said, you know what? I don't have a ceiling on how mm. much I can make, but you kind of seem like you do. That was something I had never thought of. Yeah. And being the mechanical engineer, a very data-driven person, and just somebody who I would actually listen to, I listened to him. <laughs> <laughs> and what I did was I became a part-time pharmacist, full-time mom. Could I have gotten daycare? Could I have gotten somebody to care for my kids? Yeah, I could have, but we decided as a couple that was not what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. Plus, we wanted to have another kiddo in about two years. That was just our plan. So I thought, you know, it was pretty hard being pregnant and being a pharmacist, standing on my feet all day with the challenges of going mm -hmm. to the bathroom and eating and drinking. Why would I bring that upon myself? And I'm exhausted just having a newborn. So we decided his 60000 plus my going part-time, we thought would be maybe anywhere from twenty five to 50000 that would equal what my full-time income would yeah. be if I just went out and was the sole breadwinner and he would stay at home and make no income. But you got to keep in mind, he had that opportunity to climb up the ladder, not just in title, but in earnings. Yep. So I took that leap of faith, Tim, and I let my, my career take a back seat. I wasn't that far into my career mm -hmm. and I hadn't accomplished that much. I didn't have as much to lose, I guess you could say. So that is one of the factors that played into that. Kim, what really stands out there to me is, you know, even in this case, you decided that for you and your family, it was going to be your career that was going to be, you know, a little bit on the backseat. And, and obviously you mentioned your husband realizing that there was perhaps some more upward mobility in, in role over time. But even if those roles were flipped, right? Because I think there can be a lot of pride that can come, come through, especially for the pharmacist that may be listening, thinking, hey, wait, wait a minute. I just invested, you know, two hundred thousand dollars plus six, eight, ten years of my time, uh, and maybe this is something that they are considering as well. But whether it's, you know, like your situation, or even if the role were reversed and your husband were the one to say, "Hey, I'm going to, you know, let let my career take a back seat because this is what we want to do as our family." I admire the intentionality, uh, and I'm sure these were in depth conversations that happened at the time, but really just the openness and the transparency and the intentionality of saying, okay, what do we want as our family? What do we think is best for our family unit? And that could be and is different for many different families. And there is no right or wrong answer. And I think that's so important 
for everyone to hear, but really what, what is it for you that you and your family want and how do you ultimately be able to set up the, the infrastructure and the system that works best for you? So I really respect and, and admire that. And my wife, Jess, and I have had a lot of those similar conversations along the way as well. You know, what's interesting though, so I'm reflecting in 2022, if we think about what a pharmacist is making, you know, today, your theory held true, right? So has a pharmacist income gone up since, you know, you mentioned the $97,000? It has, but if you factor in inflation and other things, it really has had a ceiling, right? It really has had a ceiling. And I think we're continuing to see that with some exceptions. And there certainly are some areas of practice where that may not necessarily be the case. So my next question for you is, you decide in 2017 that you're going to use your pharmacy background and degree in a very different way, in a non-traditional way, not only in starting your own business, but in using your voice and under the brand, what would become the pharmacist voice. And my question here is, what was the genesis of the pharmacist voice? I don't know the answer to this question, so I'm excited to, to learn the answer. How did the idea come to be and what ultimately led you to begin down this path of starting your own business? The genesis of the company name, let's start with that. It came incredibly organically because I wanted to take my background as a pharmacist and my speaking voice or my voice in writing and combine them to do something in commerce, you know, creating a company that did something. And I knew I wanted to use my voice. Now, the why, why did I want to use my voice? That is like the best part. <laughs> mm. I have a son with autism. He is currently 19 years old, almost 19 and a half. I can't believe it. And he is nonverbal. And the thing that happens to a lot of people who have a child with challenges happened to me. If you've ever seen people on the news that have a child in a wheelchair and the parent becomes a marathon runner and they mm -hmm. run those marathons together and the parent is pushing mm -hmm. the wheelchair, or if you meet somebody who has a child who ends up being a, de a deaf child, a child that's hearing impaired, that adult, that parent learns sign language yeah. and, and becomes an advocate, right? Mm -hmm. And having a person in my life who cannot speak, he cannot read, write, or speak that we know of, it really inspired me to respect my own voice and recognize the power of mm. having a voice and using it. There are so many people that don't take their passions and their strengths and use them. And you have a responsibility to use your passions and your strengths to do something that matters. And why wouldn't I take my background as a pharmacist and my speaking voice, put them together and make the pharmacist voice? And I'll tell you, there's so much more that I want to say about that, but I think I should probably pause and just let you ask your questions. Well, I think what, what I'm really curious about is, you know, you just said that there's so many folks that don't take their passions and their strengths and take action yeah. on it. And you mentioned responsibility. And I, I love that challenge because every, everyone may have a different passion or strength or different challenge and, and may feel that sense of responsibility. And for whatever reason, haven't acted on it. And that can look like a million different things. Here we're talking obviously about the pharmacist voice and the business that you started. So my question for you is, why do you think people typically are not taking action? Why are they not acting on that responsibility to be able to move forward with that passion, with that strength that they have? I mean, certainly a multitude of reasons, but if we distill it down to a couple, what, what do you think is typically blocking people from moving forward? Man, Tim, you are so lucky. I'm an ESTJ. <laughs> <laughs> I am not, a, I'm extroverted, right? So I'm not really shy about sharing and I'm a little judgmental, meaning I'm, I'm great at making decisions. So why do people have that problem, that, that challenge? And I want you to know anybody listening, I'm not judging you. Mm -hmm. If, if you have barriers to entry, if you have hangups, I think it might be part personality and my personality, if you look at the Enneagram, Mm -hmm. If anybody knows that personality test, I'm an eight. I am the challenger. I am, I don't want to say fearless, but I'm the person that sees a problem and takes it as a challenge and wants to conquer it. And 
I'm not the perfectionist, which is the number one, which is my husband. And he has a hard time with um, his perfectionism. And a lot of times I have to point it out to him and say, are you doing this because you don't understand the first step or is it because you're hesitant or Mm -hmm. have you made a list of pros and cons? I mean, help me understand. For example, he lost his job at a company he was with for more than 12 and a half years in April of 2020. It was April 30th or May 1st of 2020, right Right as the the pandemic was decided. Yeah. Jeez. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) Being the sport person I am, I I wanted to go out there and like a light switch, turn on the the business <laughs> and say, oh, I'm going to go out and make all this money. But voiceover, what I do, the voiceover industry, it's not like having a light switch. You can't mm-hmm. just turn it on. But anyways, what gets in people's way is I, I want to use my husband as an example. He wants to play a matching game. Mm-hmm. He is a mechanical engineer by training. So when he thinks about getting another job, He wants to match the word mechanical engineer, the words mechanical engineer, with somebody who's looking for a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. And what I taught him about just all the things that I know from marketing and communications and storytelling is that what you really need to think about is all those things in the Ikigai. You know, what do you love to do? What does the world need? What can you get paid to do? You know, all those things. And what do you value? Do you want to have to travel to Asia all the time, which is what he was doing two to three weeks at a time, up to five times a year? It was Ooh. hard on our family. Yeah. So anyways, that that was one of the things, perfectionism. Well, and, and we know that the the matching game uh, and perfectionism does, doesn't go too well with entrepreneurship or starting something new. No. And so my, my question for you here is I talk with many pharmacists, probably one or two a week that... I can tell they're on fire and they're passionate about something. And that something could be, you know, another W2 job. That something could be, hey, I've got this great idea for a book or for a podcast or, you know, this nonprofit. I had somebody message me recently about an idea they have for a nonprofit or a business idea, whether that's a service-based or a product-based business. But when the conversation moves to, well, what's next? What's next? I can tell instantly the tone of voice shifts. Fear starts to come into the equation and more often than not, there starts to be a paralyzing reality of like, I don't know what the next step is. And so, you know, I'm thinking about those number one Enneagram perfectionists that are out there versus, you know, the, the eight challengers where, you know, you might have an idea and it's not all fully fleshed out. Great. I'm going to do one thing. That's the next thing just to get momentum on this. And then it'll be messy and it'll get better and it'll get better and it'll get better. I get that. But a lot of people are not comfortable with that. And so my question is for, for folks that are listening to saying, I have an idea. I want to do X, Y, or Z. But there's 15 things that I'm not sure exactly where do I go next. Like, what advice would you have for them? I mean, even if you think about the pharmacist voice and I'm looking at your background and you've got nice logos and you've got services and offerings and web things and courses we'll talk about, that can be overwhelming. So like, what, what is the next step and how do people discern that? Oh, Tim, this is such a great question. I'm so excited to answer this. I had to do this too. I had that problem too. In fact, I have a whole podcast episode about how I funneled all my ideas down to one. Mm. And it comes down to, okay, if you can imagine a funnel, you're, mm-hmm. everybody's listening to this has been to pharmacy school or their students, right? I mean, think about compounding lab and you've got a funnel yeah. and in the top of the funnel, it's broader than the bottom of the funnel. And you put all of those ideas down in the in the top of the funnel, and you're going to distill it down to just one that's going to pop out the end. And that's going to be your one that you run with. And I had all these ideas, and I just put them in that funnel. And I I mentally worked my way through each of them to find out if they were even possible. And in doing that, I figured out that my number one barrier to using probably four or five of my ideas was childcare. I have Mm. a child who at the time was only, was he 15? I think he was only 15, but still rapidly approaching adulthood, can't read, write, or speak. I'm going to be taking care of this person. I'm going to be his guardian. I'm going to be his full-time caregiver until death parts us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be morbid. 
Sometimes when you have those constraints, it makes all yeah. your decisions that much easier. Yeah. So when I found out that childcare seemed to be my biggest barrier, I realized I needed to find something I could do in the gig economy. It was just that easy. And I knew through my passions, through respecting the voice and wanting to do something with my voice that heck yeah, I could continue to volunteer when I have time. People don't expect you to show up when you volunteer 100%. You just, you let them know the expectations. If they can deal with it, they let you continue to volunteer, right? Yep. It's okay to volunteer. You discover your passions that way. But then in going through mentally all these ideas, I figured out that I could not go to people's houses and help them with their medication lists and cleaning out mm -hmm. their closets? What if they were running late? What if I was running late? Yeah. What if there was a school delay or a closing or whatever? I had a sick kid, I would have to cancel on them and then making it up would be so hard. So anyways, all those things really added up. And then talking to other people, Tim, that's so important. All of your listeners who are interested in entrepreneurship should really be talking to people who do the thing that they want to do. Mm -hmm. It's common sense, but it's also great advice because when you talk to people that do the thing, for example, I wanted to go to patients' houses, help them clean out their medication closets, and help them make medication lists, you know, just doing some basic MTM type yeah. stuff then cash pay. So I wouldn't necessarily have to use the insurance company's mm -hmm. definition of MTM. I found out that in Ohio, we needed to have a T, triple D, a terminal distributor of dangerous drugs license. I think it was a level two or something. Two. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Category in order two. to have mm -hmm. patient data in my home or on my computer. And I honestly, I didn't want to deal with that. So in talking to Sue Paul, who mm -hmm. we both know through the Ohio Pharmacists Association, she's an Ohio pharmacist and pharmacogenomics queen, mm -hmm. um, I learned some of the issues that she deals with. I didn't want to deal with those issues. So again, just fleshing out those ideas, like how would I actually make this happen? What are the barriers I would come across? Who already does this? What yeah. are the challenges and the rewards? And yeah, just fleshing everything out. Out the bottom of the funnel came something where I would use my voice. And I didn't know that I would be in the voiceover industry when I started. I ended up going into voiceover because my original idea didn't even work. So I had to take that original idea that came out of the bottom of the funnel and pivot it to something else, which isn't always fun because you have to admit failure, but you got to have a short memory about it. Kind of like right. when you're up to bat and you strike out, you strike out, you still got that third pitch, you might foul or you might have a home run. So just keep swinging, you know? I love that. And, and, and no, it's great. And, and I love the practical, you know, advice that you gave in terms of, you know, the funnel and having the ideas and, you know, talking with others, which I think is not only helps you speak out loud your idea, which gets you thinking about it and more internalizing it more. It clarifies your message. Sometimes I'll have a great idea. And, you know, more often than not, the day ends, I go home and I'll, Jess, 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 I got this idea. I got this idea. And then I hear myself say it out loud. And then 24 hours passes. And I'm like, that was really not a great idea, you know, but it was in my head. And, and I started to talk it out loud. Or sometimes when I have those conversations, the idea starts to crystallize or she'll add to it. What about this? What about that? Have you thought about this? And those conversations of, you know, people that can help you build upon your idea that can, you know, help you network with other people that have been down that path before is so powerful. But you said something at the end that I think is so integral for people to remember, which is we have to, on some level, be comfortable with and accepting and embracing some failure along the way. And I think if we can shift our mind around, you know, failure typically has a negative connotation, but an opportunity to grow and to learn, but being comfortable with that. And you mentioned the first idea that popped out of the funnel, right? You had to pivot and do something else. And perhaps a whole separate conversation about how we get comfortable with failure. But I think re really good advice for folks that are looking to get started. Because even if you come up with the perfect game plan, guess what? It ain't going to be perfect. And there's going to be things and, and bumps along the road that are going to come come to be. Yeah. You got to have that abundance mindset. That's right. Like There's more than one idea here. And it's okay to flesh them out and write them down too and revisit them. Because like you said, Tim, 
you may come home and talk to your wife, Jess, and say, I have the best idea. But then when it comes out of your mouth, it doesn't sound so good. But she's kind of like a good sounding board and Mm -hmm. she'll tell you what's good about it. And maybe you can just write it down. So I hope everybody out there has their own Jess or even a notepad and sleep on it and look at it another day. I love it. I love it. We're now, uh, I've got four boys at home. I've talked about them before on my podcast, but it's been fun is my oldest is now about to be 11 and he's heard so many of these conversations with, with my wife and I, you know, just in passing. And just this weekend, you know, he came up with a, well, dad, what about this idea? And, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it save time if we had a toothbrush that had two different brushes so you could brush the top and the bottom at once? And is that something that could be invented? I was like, that's it, right? You got to throw ideas out there. It's a process. They evolve and see, see what happens over time. So as it relates to the pharmacist's voice, what do you offer? What, what is the business? What's the offering? And how has that evolved you know, since 2017 to what you're working on right now? Starting in 2017, my original idea was to narrate pharmacy continuing education journals into audio. My original idea didn't work. I approached all kinds of companies. For example, APHA. I approached the Ohio Pharmacists Association. I approached Pharmacist Letter. There were others too. And I just, I pitched it to somebody the other day, but I I have a little bit more proof of concept now that I've been in the voiceover industry. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I didn't have proof of concept. I didn't really know what I was talking about. I didn't know how to record, edit, and produce audio at the time. And everybody said no. And that's all I needed. And it's not like I gave up early or anything. I just thought, if they don't like this particular idea, let's try something else. Mm. And what I did was I pivoted. And the first thing I did was when I pivoted, I went to talk to somebody who could teach me how to record, edit, and produce audio. Somebody who I thought could help me with that. (laughs) Went to a local audio engineer and he said, oh yeah, we record people here, but I'm the one that records them. I'm the one that edits them. Mm. I'm the one that produces the final files and gives them to the client. That's a high ticket item right there. It's expensive. So I thought, well, gosh, how can I do this at home? And I went on a journey of learning how to record, edit, and produce audio. And I'll tell you, that's the hardest thing about, for me, the hardest thing about having a podcast, hardest thing about producing audiobooks, which is one of the services I offer. It's the hardest thing about creating voiceovers. I had to spend a lot of time in the trenches and believe it or not, pharmacists would be awesome at this. I mean, if that was like part of the thing, like, yes, we dispense pills, we make IVs, we mix audio, you know, pharmacists (laughs) are very detail oriented people. It turned out I love it and I'm great at it. So on my journey, I learned I can record, edit and produce this. Great. What am I going to talk about? What am I going to produce? And one of the things that the audio engineer that I talked to did for me was he connected me to my very first voiceover coach. I thought, what's a voiceover coach? I don't know what this is. I don't know if I want to do this. But he said, you need to learn how to talk and have good mic skills and all these things. So I went to Nancy Wolfson. If you're going to write this down, just please know that she's more of an advanced instructor, instructor, which is what I found out when I started working with her. And she focuses on commercial narration. Mm -hmm. Once I did, I don't know if it was eight lessons or something like that, I realized I needed to do medical narration because my heart just wasn't into talking about pantyhose and (laughs) banks and, um, you know, things that are on the news or Mm -hmm. not on the news, uh, radio ads or television ads. So anyways, I started working with a different coach and his name's David Rosenthal and he's with the Global Voice Acting Academy. Definitely look that one up because they do teach young voice actors if you're interested. And he helped me with medical narration. And he's like, yeah, you can say the words great. And I don't want to paint him in a bad light, but he said things that I needed to hear. He Mm -hmm. said that you basically don't know how to deliver. You know how to say the words just fine. You sound like you sound like you know what you're talking about. But then other parts of the delivery are not so great. During that that whole discovery period and learning, I took group classes, I took private classes, I made my first demo. And moving forward, I have worked with other coaches too. Now, how did audiobooks come into this? Audiobooks came into this because 
if you can do audiobooks, you can do e-learning, which is mm. what I have learned. That is what I originally wanted to do. Narrating pharmacy continuing education journals into mm -hmm. audio format is e-learning. So I learned how to do audiobooks and e-learning at the same time. I'm an audiobook narrator. I narrate books that are on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. They're for sale. Two, two examples are Impact Pharmacist, Start Your Own Wellness Practice and Leave Your Retail Pharmacy Job Behind by Asha and Eric Bohannon. Mm -hmm. And I've also narrated Perimenopause, The Savvy Sister's Guide to Hormone Harmony. So as I've been going through this journey, I, I have been figuring out what people want to pay me to do. Well, I like that too, because I think it connects back to what we were talking before. You know, now you've got service offerings, but I'm guessing those have evolved and changed over time as you kind of figure out what does the market need and want? What is the market willing to pay for? What are they not willing to pay for? Yes. And then obviously you start to spread that through word of mouth. And so again, just a great reminder that as folks are getting started with an idea, where you start and where it goes is going to be an evolution. It is. And you're going to look back and say, I can't believe... You know, I remember back to my first blog post, November 6, 2015. I read it recently. Yes, it had a great, great story of our journey, but wow, like writing had a lot to be, you know, desired for. I think back to the first podcast that we did in 2017. And so it's a journey, it's an evolution. And I'm hopeful that we'll say the same thing, you know, five years down the road as well. And if folks want to learn more about the work you're doing at the Pharmacist Voice and the offerings you have, they can go to the pharmacistvoice.com. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. And you mentioned your summer project before we hit record is you're working on an online course. Tell us more about that. Yes. Thanks for the opportunity. If you go to kimnewlove.com, you can see my current online course offering. It's a drug name pronunciation course, believe it or not. And it's called Pronounce Drug Names Like a Pro. The next online course, which I have not released yet, but it will be on kimnewlove.com, hopefully by the end of August. That's my goal. It will be a behind the scenes look at the Pharmacist Voice podcast. The Pharmacist Voice, of course, is my company, but I am a business with a podcast, much like your financial pharmacist. Mm -hmm. So the name of my podcast is the Pharmacist Voice podcast. <laughs> and a lot of people ask me all the time, how do I start a podcast? Mm -hmm. How do you make your podcast? So this is going to be how I make my podcast, not how you need to make yours. Because a lot of people just want to know what goes into it. What does it look like to edit audio? Because you're taking a visual representation of something you can hear. And not everybody really understands how you can manipulate something that you can see, but you end up hearing it. It's, it's really something. So yeah, that's my summer project, Tim. Thanks for asking. Well, I'm looking forward to, to that coming out because I, I have a lot of folks that I talk with that have interesting ideas or are thinking about starting a podcast and they often, mm -hmm. you know, get hung up in some of the, well, what equipment should I use and what platform should I use to record? And, you know, there's a million options that are out there and, and I like your yeah. approach of kind of a behind the scenes of what you're doing, which I think will, will give people some structure and some, you know, hooks to, to be able to hang some things on, but not necessarily the only way to be able to do or release a, a podcast show. Yes, I agree. And Tim, just to add something real quick, that hopefully is going to feed into me training pharmacists or healthcare providers, small cohorts at a time, how to start their own podcasts if there is interest. So send those people my way. I would love to help them. It, it'd be kind of like a white glove type thing where you have an yeah, idea of what you cool. want to do and you want you want to flatten that learning curve. I can totally help you do it. I mean, I have my own podcast. I'm on episode 160 something. I know how to love do it. this. Love it. I love it. One of the things I want to ask you about is, you know, I, I, I personally feel that we're in a period of time where there's somewhat of an over glorification of entrepreneurship. And I, I love entrepreneurship. I think it's something that, you know, the, the skills that are within owning your own business and starting your own business are things that everyone can learn something from whether or not you have your own business. So obviously I'm a huge fan and, and have really found great benefit in my own journey. But I think there are sometimes some myths that come to be with owning your own business that people think, oh, well, if I just own my own business, like everything would be okay. So my question for you is like, is there a myth or two that you have found in your own journey and owning your own business that you'd like to share with, with the audience? 
Oh my gosh. How many do I get to share? <laughs> <laughs> get, go, go with it. Okay. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to share this because with what I do now, which is voiceover, I do medical narration for pharmaceutical companies, biotech. I do e-learning. I do explainer videos. I do all this. People think you can just plug a microphone into a computer and talk and the Brinks truck will back up and dump <laughs> a bunch of money in your driveway. That I would say is the number one myth about what I do now. What I do is voiceover and it is not like that. There are actual studies now for the voiceover industry to demonstrate that people who have been in the business, who are just starting out, who work part-time like me, typically make $8,000 or less when they first start out. Per year. I work very part-time and yeah. I make I make less than $8,000 a year. And I will proudly say that, but it is in, increasing and I have negotiated $10,000 deals, $20,000 deals, and just the projects never went into production. So I've had great opportunities, but oh my gosh, the ups and downs of the gig economy mm -hmm. are crazy. So I just want to point that out. And I would say you're not going to make $100,000 right away for sure. And then as an entrepreneur, I would say there's just, there's a lot of risk, but you have to be smart about it. You know, you have to not dump all of your savings into the the shiny objects that you see, you know, it's, you got to have boundaries. You know, if yes. somebody says, oh, this microphone's the best in the business, you find out what's a starter microphone and see if you even like doing it. Yeah. Yeah. If there's anything else I can uh, tell you, let me know. Cause I'll tell you, there's so many things, so many myths and misconceptions about voiceover industry alone. Um, but entrepreneurship, I mean, Gosh, I could go on and on about that in general. Let me know what you want to know, Tim. Smart risk is is resonates with me. You know, I I I tend to have some shiny object syndrome myself. I think many entrepreneurs do. And it could be a new piece of equipment. It can be a new piece of software, right? A new solution, a course. And yeah, you know, I think one of the challenges is you continue to grow in your business journey and you grow your network and you talk with other people. Inevitably, you come across conversations like the one we're having, and someone may say, Well, I use this tool or I use this software, I use this. And you're like, oh, like I need that, right? I need that piece of equipment, that piece of software. And so, you know, sometimes the answer is yes, that's going to be a valuable solution, but really taking smart risk and, and making sure you're staying on course with the core offering and, and not getting distracted by that, I think is really, really smart. Related to smart risk, I want to wrap up our conversation by bringing together the personal financial journey with your business journey. And when I talk with a lot of aspiring pharmacy entrepreneurs, one of the hurdles that typically comes up is the intersection between the personal financial journey and being able to start the business with confidence. And that could be because of student loan debt. That could be because they have you know, a young family and there's lots of competing financial expenses. That could be because they feel like they're behind on retirement and they don't feel like they're in a financial position of strength to be able to lean into their business idea. And so my question for you, as you started the journey in 2017, how did your personal finance plan intersect with your ability to start the business and to feel confident making that jump forward? I love this question so much. When, oh boy, we took Financial Peace University, the Dave Ramsey class at our church in 2013, and that made a big difference in how we attacked debt. And I would say that the the mortgage payoff was in the horizon. Like we we were almost there when I started mm -hmm. my business. I started my business November of 2017, right at the end of the year. And then we paid off our mortgage March of 2019. Having that financial freedom and really honestly extra space in my mm. mind to let myself dream about what could be was huge. Mm -hmm. So I would say we started off investing in our futures through 401ks and Roth IRAs early. Okay. My husband, as soon as he got a job that had a 401k, I believe he was at least doing employer match and then eventually maxing out. Currently maxes out. I think 18,500 is his current uh, contribution per year. And that's the maximum I believe he's allowed um, per some law. Right, Tim? It's up a little bit in 2022. 20, I think it's a little bit north of 20,000, 20,500. But 
he may. Okay, I'm sure he'll be there soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he probably is. Probably is. Yeah. Yeah. But then I had my Roth IRA that I started in college because we had a speaker come to class and during our management and marketing class. And that guy, I just called him up afterwards and I said, hey, you want to be my financial plan- planner? And he did. He became my financial planner. His company is still my financial planning company 22 years later. And I have all that growth and that trust and that relationship. So slow, slow steps to, to building the financial plan. You mentioned in, in 2017, yeah. specifically the business, having that home paid off was a big part of feeling confident to have the margin uh, to get the business off the ground. And I, and I think that's great because I think some, sometimes, you know, and every business is different, right? If somebody is developing a product-based business or a business that requires a lot of inventory, there might be a lot more upfront costs. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I think of what we started at YFP, I, I believe of what you've done as well, certainly some upfront costs, but maybe not to the magnitude of a product-based business uh, where you may need to have some more upfront capital, but nonetheless need, need to have a solid financial foundation in place to be able to make that journey and to do it with confidence. Yes. Thank you for summarizing that. <laughs> I feel like there's so many little details that I could bring up, but yeah, I don't know if you how much into the weeds you want me to get. I think that if somebody is going to take a risk, a calculated risk and start a business, you need to do your homework. I did my homework to find out, you know, once I discovered the voiceover industry, can I afford to do this? And I found out that the microphone that I wanted was only like 199 bucks. I needed a stand, but I needed training. It was like $200 a pop that for an hour, I needed a demo. It cost X number of dollars. And without a mortgage, we had that available capital and we were still investing. And yeah, over time, the investments, I mean, if you are faithful and you have a good strategy, you will eventually get closer to your retirement goal. But you you need to have a goal in the first place and you got to start right. somewhere. And I highly recommend that Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University, and also getting somebody that you trust to help you with your journey. Great advice. Kim, this has been a lot of fun and I appreciate you taking time to come on the show. Again, for folks that want to Learn more about what Kim's up to. You can go to thepharmacistvoice.com or also visit and also visit kimnewlove.com and keep up to date with the newest course that she's working on starting a podcast. So Kim, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Tim. Take care. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archived newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.